zero. So usually this is rank three. Usually in many points this is invertible. However, at some points it's not invertible locally, the function. So most places this function gives you an image which is three-dimensional locally, but some places it drops down to being a two-dimensional image is the way I think of it. Yeah. And um, so here's another example. You can look at sub the determinants of submatrices, and that will tell you some things. Like here, I have f of x, y, z, x squared, comma, y, z. So here's mapping from R3 to R2. If I tell you the rank is more than 2, we should say, say that Dr. Cook was an idiot when he wrote these notes. OK. Phew. OK. Good. Rank 2. 2, 2, 2. But to get rank 2, I just need that any, I need at least I need just any pair, any, any given pair being linearly independent will do it. The third one has to be linearly dependent because we only have two dimensions to work with. So if you get two linearly independent vectors in two dimensions, the third one has to be linearly dependent, right? If we learn nothing else from linear algebra, we should have learned this. But I can tell you, having graded many finals of linear algebra, this is just my wish. It's not the reality of linear algebra. <laughs> Students have a lot of trouble with dimension theory for some reason. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, basically, these are the three sub-matrices you can think about. If the determinant of any one of these is non-zero, that suffices to give you rank two. You guys starting to see how this game is played? Um, here's a mapping from R2 to R3. What's the rank of the Jacobian here? Um, well, if x is equal to y, then these match up, right? So x equals to y is a place where I'm going to have rank 1. I always have rank at least 1 because of this lovely 1 here. can't be identically 0, so rank 0 is not an option. And um, I think you can, again, let's see here. What's the, uh, what's the best way to, s I guess you can just look at, is there a multiple of one or the other? Uh, you can calculate the kernel of it. You can look at the, you can look at the, 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 the the determinants of these little two by two matrices. I, I don't know if that really tells me anything, though. I'm not. I'm not confident about that. Hmm. I wonder if this is right. Well, so what did I say? If if any one of these is, I don't trust these notes. I don't. I don't trust. I'm not sure. I trust this. Determinant of m1 is 2x squared minus 2y squared. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, now, how do I get that the rank is oh for y not equal to x? Well, that's what I saw from just looking at it. I don't think it's enough to have one of the determinants being 0, though, because that just shows me that that subpart of the three vectors are linearly dependent. I need all three of them being linearly dependent to collapse the rank of the big matrix. So I would say I would say I would say view this example with caution. Yeah. Here's another one. All right. A few more examples. Example ten. I mean that that obviously has rank three because look at these ones. These are linearly independent. You can take the um, oh, this much is true. If you look at if you've got a matrix like this, which has more rows than columns, if you look at the determinant of the submatrices, if one of those determinants is non-zero, then that suffices to prove that the rank of the matrix is as is, is many as is, is, is maximal. See, if the determinant of the upper three by three matrix is non-zero, that means that those are linearly independent. But you can't have linearly independent vectors and then add another component and get them to be linearly dependent. That's just not, that's not possible. So you can look at, if, if you find that the determinant of a submatrix is non-zero in this case, then that's, that suffices to show maximal rank. And the other one, I needed just the, well, I guess it's kind of the same, right? The determinant of any 2 by 2 was, was sufficient. So 
We don't think too much about determinants of submatrices in linear, so this is kind of a new discussion, right? If you hadn't had linear with me, this is, this, is still no, this is still new. This is not a discussion I ever have in linear algebra about determinants of submatrices. There's just no need. We have other tools there. Okay, so anyway, this I think is a good batch of examples, um, both to to read to get a better idea of what the rank of a Jacobian means, what it looks like, you know. Um, but obviously, you should be wary of the details there, as they are somewhat suspect. Okay, so but the next thing on our to-do list is to talk about uh, tangent and normal spaces. All right. So sorry, sorry, I haven't. I feel like there there is a more awesome example that could be given in this class. I mean, the examples I looked at here with you guys were kind of ugly, but I wanted to show you the the you know the 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 unreasonable effectiveness of the differential method. Taking differentials of things and calculating formally, um, to me is it's it's surprising how often it works. After all, it is in some sense just a notation, but it's, it's a powerful notation. So I'm going to move on, though, to the question of what, you know, tangents, tangent and normals, and normal spaces to manifolds in Rn. OK. So you know, what's a tangent space? What's a normal space? But first, what's, what's a manifold in Rn, right? So let me try to describe it for you. Basically, here's the idea. A manifold is some, let's say, m-dimensional space in Rn is a, is a preliminary description I would give of it. That begs the question, what do we mean m-dimensional space, right? Let me, let me call it k-dimensional in, in order to bring better contrast to k and n, OK? So it's a k-dimensional space. There are basically two ways to look at a manifold in Rn, two descriptions of it we can give. Basically, this either means we can view it parametrically or implicit. So parametrically, it's, it's something like, you know, I've got some subset u. Over here is my parameter space, right? And so I've got some mapping x. And up here, here's x1, here's x2, here's x3 through xn. This is in n dimensions. And so my, you know, my mapping x gives me a patch. It maps this u up into Rn. And this mapping x is called a patch. Or parameterization, if you like. Um, and so we want that to be mostly one to one, right? And um, we want it to have, well, we want it to have, to have full rank. I want the rank of that, the, the Jacobian of x to be, to be k, so that I actually get a k-dimensional image. That's basically the condition, the rank of the Jacobian of x should be equal to, should be equal to k at all points. That condition you've already seen in calculus three, as we study curves, we insist that they're nonstop. To insist the curve is nonstop or regular is to, just to insist it has non-zero velocity. But the velocity vector is the Jacobian matrix. So to assume non-zero velocity is just to give you rank one, which means you have a one-dimensional thing that's a curve. That's a one-dimensional manifold. We also study surfaces in calculus three. And surfaces, we talk about regular surfaces. We talk about uh, x of uv, or maybe you talked about r of uv, right? And you, in there, you look at partial r, partial u, cross partial r, partial v. 
that turns out to be related to the determinant of the Jacobian of the mapping. So that being non-zero, a non-vanishing normal vector field is equivalent to the condition that the, um, the parameterization of a surface be full rank, have rank two. Surface is two-dimensional. But you can do higher dimensional manifolds in Rn if you have a, a, an N sufficiently large. So that's the parametric viewpoint. You just, you find a patch onto the surface, all right? The other viewpoint is implicit. So the implicit viewpoint says that I'm going to call this thing, say, M, all right? And that, that just that M is equal to the inverse image of some, some, some constant vector, let's say C for F, a function from what? A, fun a function from Rn to what? What I'm saying is I can either realize the manifold as the image of a patch, or I can realize it as the solution set to some system of equations. So how many equations do I knew, need to fix a k-dimensional space in an n-dimensional context? K? No. I need k linearly independent columns in the Jacobian. Of the, it, this is the direct thing. This is what involves k. That's kind of mirrored. You need n minus k. So I need the, I would need here, I need the rank of f is equal to n minus k because it's, it's, it's inverse. That assures that the, the level set is genuinely k-dimensional by the implicit function theorem, actually. Let me show you an example before we go today. Oh, I still have 10 minutes, right? I don't know why, it still makes me happy. <laughs> Never forget the day I came in and started lecturing 10 minutes early and nobody told me. People keep coming late to my class, I'm like, what is going on here? Why are all these people late? And then finally it hits me. You jerks, why didn't you tell me I started 10 minutes early? Come on! <laughs> then nobody said anything, they just let me go. So, so, so I rude. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you should have done. So here, here's one. Um, how about this? X of, uh, let's see here, theta, phi, and psi. So let's see here. Cosine theta, sine phi, sine psi, sine theta, sine phi, sine psi. Those are just a bunch of squiggles, and you know it. They're not squiggles. <laughs> These are these these are these are legit. Let's see here. Um, that made me that made me forget my okay sine phi, cosine phi, and then finally cosine pitchfork. <laughs> and here I'm I'm saying zero less than or equal to theta less than or equal to two pi, and on the other hand zero less than or equal to phi psi less than or equal to pi. So here's a picture of that. Well, two, three, four, and x1. So. Um, So over here is my parameter space, theta, phi, psi, three-dimensional parameter space. It maps onto that space, right? And I could also look at it as the inverse image um, of, let's say, one for what? f of x1, x2, x3, x4 equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared.
what I have shown you here, my friends, is a three-dimensional manifold embedded in a four-dimensional space. You can, you can set this equal to x1, this equal to x2, this equal to x3, this equal to x4. You add their squares. They collapse down. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. These two collapse to sine squared phi, sine squared um, pitch fork. And then the sine squared pitch fork cancels to give you sine squared pitch fork times cosine squared phi, sine squared phi. And then you just have sine squared pitch fork plus cosine squared pitch fork, which gives you 1. So in fact, this is a parameterization of this level set. These are two different ways of describing this, which is my silly picture of the so-called three-sphere, which is a subset of R4. It's the, yeah, it's a four-dimensional sphere. Well, it's, a, it's the sphere in four dimensions, which happens to be three-dimensional itself. Yeah, I've been drawing n-spheres since pre-calculus. Every time I draw a circle, it's just a question of like, how you label it. I mean, that's a sphere, right? It's a, it's a good picture. You're just looking at it the wrong way. Look, yeah, circle is a sphere. <laughs> so I'm looking at a cross-section of a four-dimensional sphere. Indeed, yes. <laughs> okay. But we have these two viewpoints, right? We have the parametric viewpoint and the implicit viewpoint. So what I'm going to describe next class is how do you actually find the tangent space to these things? And then how do you find the space which is normal to those? And again, the Jacobian is center stage. It's all Jacobians, it's, and it's a nice, nice bit of linear algebra. But I will start by reviewing for you the theory of orthogonal complements in linear algebra next time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>